so shall we close our eyes in prayer and look into your Father in heaven. Loving, gracious, heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for your abundant grace upon us, Lord. We are so unworthy, so wretched sinners that we are, that, Lord, who are we that you should show compassion and mercy and grace upon us? Thank you, O Father. Thank you that you had compassion on us, that you are that your heart was moved with compassion when you saw us dead in our trespasses and sins and you said to us, you commanded live and you said live abundantly. Thank you, Jesus, for coming down to this earth to give your life as a ransom for us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for making all these things so real in our lives, so practical and so experiential, so real in our day-to-day -day life situation. So, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. We worship before you and we humble ourselves to that most. We, Lord, we would humble ourselves to be a zero before you, to be a nothing and a nobody before you, so that you can cleanse us thoroughly with your blood once again and flood our hearts afresh with your Holy Spirit beyond measure and give us words that are spirit and are life. Yes, Father, we want to hear from you, Lord Jesus. Just as you would have spoken to the disciples when we were walking on this earth, Lord, like that, we want to hear your voice voice, the still small voice, the voice is sound of many waters, the voice loud as a thunder, the voice loud as a trumpet. Yes, Father, we want to hear your voice in our spirit and we want to surrender to your word and to be edified and to be built up in our inner man that the word become, become flesh in our inner man, Lord Jesus, so that you would become mature more with your wisdom and more with your knowledge and that with the spirit of knowledge and counsel and wisdom, you fill us, Lord. And Lord, as we meditate your word, we want to see you, Jesus, in the mirror of the word. Help each one of us. Glorify your name alone. We want to decrease and we want you to increase in Jesus' precious sweetest name we pray. Amen. Amen. So it's really the Lord's mercy that the Lord enabled us to meditate through his word, uh, verse by verse and even word by word. Last week when I was, uh, you know, the doing the thumbnail uh, that I was uh, the worst to worst that thing just got deleted when I was doing that then <laughs> then I put it word by word because actually uh, actually it is not a worst to worst Bible study that we are uh, doing but rather a word to word Bible study by the Lord's grace that uh, we are able to because we are going slowly we are able to go word by word and even to the root meanings of uh, many words and uh, and we, we we should be so grateful to the Lord for all these provisions that we have in these days of internet and apps, which help us to delve deeper into the word. God has given us so many resources. Like I said, the Blue Letter Bible app, BLB, Blue Letter Bible app, which helps me to go to the uh, Greek and Hebrew root meanings. And that uh, um, has really helped me in my spiritual walk with the Lord to have real revelations from the Lord, which uh, really helps me not just to you know uh, preach and teach but more than that uh, to experience the reality of that in my life uh, and i when i think about the greek root meaning and one thing i'm uh, again and again reminded of uh, the amazing uh, revelation about that is one uh, of that is from that hebrews 4:12 the word of god is living and active sharper than any two edged sword that pierces as far as the division, as that is what NASB says. But when I was uh, just looking into the, I think uh, we were doing that Hebrews Bible study that time. And uh, so when I was looking into the uh, Greek word, it was uh, partition, uh, division. Partition is another meaning. And then suddenly you know, <laughs> it dawned upon me. It was a, a great revelation that, oh, that, that partition is that veil. That I, the same Hebrews 10, 19, 20 says about that partition, that veil. And, uh, and like that, uh, you know, if I had not gone to that Greek root meaning, I wouldn't have uh, understood that verse in that light. Of course, actually, <clears throat> uh, more than understanding all that, this experiencing is more important. But God has given us the gift of teaching also in the church so that we can understand the word of God in depth so that we ourselves can be equipped and strengthened in faith and we can strengthen others also. And we were in Revelation chapter 2 and we almost finished the message to the church at Pergamos or Pergamum uh, and 
uh, we so <coughs> How the you know uh, almost the uh, the three messages to the first three churches, uh, church at Ephesus, it was a loveless church, church that lost its first love for the Lord, the passion and devotion to the Lord, the that church lost in the midst of many many activities and religious deeds, and then the church at Smyrna was a fiery church, faithful church suffering church persecuted church and uh, that church stood faithful to the lord proving to us uh, the smyrna uh, the church at smyrna and as well as the church at philadelphia which we see from revelation 3 uh, verse 7 to 13 uh, so if we see these two churches among all the other seven churches these two churches stand out in that jesus didn't have anything to correct in them they Jesus didn't have to tell them repent because they had already repented and they were already continually in a spirit of repentance before the Lord because uh, the elders in those churches were faithful men and they were guiding the church in the right direction and the pure word of God was proclaimed and uh, uh, the Lord didn't have anything to correct in them. Such a hope. Uh, that gives that even in this day and days we can have churches where Jesus can point out and say, uh, yeah, I do not have anything to correct in you. So that's a possibility and we all have to pray that uh, you know the churches that we are part of should be in that direction. <coughs> and uh, we saw the message to the church at Pergamos or Pergamum. Uh, verse 12 onwards, uh, Revelation chapter 2, verse 12 onwards, and we saw how the church was pure at the time of Antipas, who was a faithful witness of the Lord, verse 13, but he was martyred. And then another elder came, another uh, brother who was responsible for the sharing of the word of God mainly in that church and he tolerated although he didn't indulge in the teachings of he didn't propagate the teaching of Balaam or teaching of Nicolaitans he tolerated uh, who were teaching teaching and preaching in such a way as to earn more money and uh, for material gain for sordid gain they were preaching that is what we read in First Peter 5 if we turn to First Peter 5 there we read not for sordid gain. That is what Peter says in 1 Peter 5, verse 2. Shepherd the flock of God. Shepherd, poimeno. Poimeno, that is the shepherding. Uh, shepherd the flock of God among you. <coughs> exercising oversight, not under compulsion. Uh, not just because somebody told you, somebody appointed you, but you're sure that the Lord has called you for that. Not under compulsion, but voluntarily, happily. Uh, as a, an expression of love to the Lord, that we, are, we should serve the Lord according to the will of God and not for sordid gain, but with eagerness. Of course, the uh, those who serve the Lord, are uh, they have the right to accept uh, gifts and all. Even Paul did that at times, but he didn't do that every time. He uh, himself worked with his own hands, tent making he was doing and that. Uh, he supported himself and those who were with him and all. So this salary system and all those things in the uh, church system today is unheard of in the first century. And, uh, and we know that, you know, we CFC churches and all, we uh, stand against all those uh, corrupt systems which are not there in the word of God uh, as a unique testimony to the Lord, which the Lord has done in our midst that there are people even today who are willing to work for the Lord as shepherds, as elders in the churches without taking any salary. Uh, and so they're not for sordid gain, but with eagerness, nor it is loading it over allotted to your charge. This load, uh, you know, the sordid gain is the teaching of Balaam and loading over those allotted to your charge is the teaching of Nicolaitans. That is what we see in First Peter 5, 2 and 3. No, it is loading it over those allotting to your charge, but proving to be examples to the flock. As examples, if somebody goes in front of the sheep, he is a shepherd. If somebody is going behind the sheep and flogging the sheep, that means that sheep are taken for slaughter only. It is not the shepherd who is guiding that. So 
a true uh, true leader of course actually all of us may not be called to be elders or uh, leaders in the churches but we all have of course you know many of you many of us are fathers and mothers we are elders fathers and mothers are leaders in our own homes and uh, yeah you know we might have younger siblings and we are <laughs> elders to our younger siblings uh, like our younger sister our younger brother uh, like that and even those who are younger to the lord in us we are we are to be an example before the uh, us Paul says to Timothy in 1 Timothy 4 12, let no one look down upon you. Let, let no one look down upon your youthfulness, but in faith, love, purity, conduct, show yourself as an example. 1 Timothy chapter 4, uh, you know, how example we should be before others, not only uh, for the leaders of the main leaders of the churches, but even actually we might have a Sunday school ministry. We might have a, uh, what to say, even, uh, you know, encouraging other sisters in the church as a sister in the church. And uh, you might be a youth leader or you might be uh, having some, like, you know, of course, uh, you know, all of us have will have some people who are younger to us in the Lord. <laughs> uh, even if we are newly converted also, those who are converted to the Lord after us <laughs> uh, would be younger to us in the Lord and, and uh, we should be an example. And not only to those who are uh, younger to us, but even to everyone. That's what First Timothy 4.12, let no one look down on your youthfulness. <clears throat> Just because you are young, let no one look down on you, but you have to be an example, show yourself as an example of those who believe in what all areas, in speech, how you speak, uh, the way you speak, the graciousness and the truthfulness and the authority, the dignity and the purity in that speech, that speech that impart grace, words that impart grace as we read in Ephesians 4.29, uh, words that are seasoned with salt. Uh, words with grace, season as it were with soul, Colossians 4, 6. Be an example in speech, then uh, conduct, how you behave, how you behave with older people, with younger people, with those of the opposite gender, with little kids, and uh, how you respect authorities in the church, how you uh, conduct yourself uh, in your workplace, in your in your school or college, in your uh, neighborhood, uh, in the in the marketplace, in the streets, your conduct and your love, how you forgive others and you love even your enemies and do good to those who hate you and curse those who, uh, sorry, and bless those who curse you and uh, pray for those who persecute you as we read in Luke 6, 27, 28. And uh, then an example in faith, uh, in difficult times, even in difficult times, or apparently easier times also, to clinging on to the Lord in everything, trusting the Lord in all situations, unwavering in trials. Your faith should be an example to your children, to those younger to you. Others should be able to look up to you. See how that brother, that sister is having faith in spite of all what is happening in her in his life. So we should be an example in faith, trusting the Lord and believing that the Lord will make everything to work together for our good and his grace is sufficient for us and he will not allow us to be tested beyond what we are able to bear. So we were quoting Romans 8, 28 and 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 1 Corinthians 10, 13. And uh, so be an example in faith and be an example in purity. Purity in your looks, purity in your words, purity in your conduct and purity in your secret life, purity in your home life and uh, at your place of work, wherever. Show yourself be, to be an example. And so uh, so that's, uh, that is uh, proving to be an example to the flow of First Peter 5, 3. And uh, so First Peter 5, 2 and 3, we see the warning against the teaching of Balaam, how Peter the Apostle <laughs> Uh, waged the war against the false teachings with the sword of the word of God. But, and even in Second Peter, you know, Peter is really lashing out against the false prophets. And the, even uh, he is mentioning about Balaam in Second Peter 2.15. Uh, 
in malayalam it is in 16 also 15 and 16 in english it is in 15 <coughs> uh, second beta 215 forsaking the right way they have gone astray uh, in even in verse 14 uh, having eyes full of adultery that never cease from sin enticing unstable souls having a heart trained in greed accursed children forsaking the right way the right way is the narrow way of the cross the new and living way jesus being the way they have gone astray having followed the way of balaam the son of beor who loved the wages of unrighteousness uh, you know, somebody is calling you to curse Israel and he is going there. Although he is not cursing Israel directly, he, is, uh, he kept teaching Bala to put a stumbling block before the people, sons of Israel that they went after idolatry and immorality. That is what we read in Numbers 24 and 25, which we read in uh, Revelation 2, 14 also. <clears throat> And the spiritual adultery and spiritual idolatry with the world. Idolatry, mainly the greed. Uh, greed, which is we greed amounting to idolatry. We read that in Colossians 3, 5. And adultery, that is spiritual adultery. Because even uh, the same things we read about idolatry and adultery in verse 20 also, in the message to the church at Tayatira also. Uh, there are also immorality and adultery we read. And they... We read that verse 23, I will kill her children with pestilence. So if it was physical adultery, we cannot imagine God telling that I will punish the children born out of physical adultery. God doesn't do that. God is just God because the children didn't do any uh, sin. It was their parents' fault. So from that, we understand from that, of course, and even from the context, we understand it is not the physical adultery, but spiritual adultery. And what is spiritual adultery? Adulteresses. Uh, James 4, 4, do you not know that friendship with the world is an enmity, uh, enmity to God? Those who desire to become a friend with the world is an enemy of God. That is what we read in James 4, 4. So if we, even, even if we do not end up becoming a friend of the world, if we have a desire, even a secret desire to be a friend of the world, what is the world? Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, pride of life. First John 2, 16. So, if we are indulging in the flaming arrows of the evil one, Ephesians 6, 16 is coming and uh, we are just uh, surrendering our will, exercising in our will and indulging in our self-will. That is our flesh, the lust of our flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life, which are in the flesh, is uh, joining with the flaming arrows of the evil one and we want to become friends of the world the world and the world system and its fashions and its styles and uh, its uh, way of thinking and uh, its pomp and show and its impurity and uh, its pride and its arrogance and uh, its self-centeredness. So if we are, that is spiritual adultery. And uh, uh, here we read that uh, <coughs> uh, this there was a, this teaching of Balaam in the church, which was promoting or giving way to this adultery, spiritual adultery, worldliness and idolatry and greed for money and just making um, godliness as a means of gain as we read in First Timothy 6.5. For many people, godliness is a, you know, with actually they use Christ's name to make money or honor for themselves. And uh, we read that in First Timothy <coughs> First Timothy chapter 5, we read there verse 6, yeah, verse 5, constant friction between men of depraved mind and deprived of the truth. They are of depraved mind. Their mind is not renewed as we are instructed in Romans 12, 2, but rather mind is guided by the flesh, by the self. And uh, they are deprived of the truth. The truth of the word of God is not guiding them anymore. but it is the world system that is guiding them. And they suppose that godliness is a means of gain. Yeah, with this Christianity, I want to uh, make more contacts to promote my business. I want to make a name for myself. I want to promote my empire, my kingdom, not the Lord's kingdom. I want to become great. I want to become the Maharaja, the leader. I want to be popular, known, and uh, I want to be admired by everybody. So it's a means of gain for these people. But godliness actually is a means of great gain when accompanied by 
contentment if we are really content and it is a uh, means of great gain for our spirituality uh, and of course whatever we need the lord will add to us uh, is what we read in matthew 6 uh, Matthew 6, 33 also seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. So uh, that is the teaching of Balaam, uh, Revelation 2, 14 and teaching of Nicolaitans, people who are loading of others and the Nicolaitans, the word meaning is conquerors of people and the teaching of, uh, we read about the deeds of Nicolaitans in verse 6, Revelation 2, 6 and teaching of Nicolaitans in uh, verse Six uh, fifteen. So, because the word of God doesn't have any other reference about what this teaching or deeds of Nicolaitans are, when we look at the Greek root meaning, it was in Greek language in this book of Revelation, as all the other books in the New Testament were written. Uh, so, when we look at the Greek root meaning, that means congress of people. That means actually those who were loading our people, like the priests and the pastors. You know, uh, you know. Nowadays, actually, pastor is a title for people. Uh, pastor just means shepherd. Ephesians 4.11, God has given uh, some as apostles, prophets, pastors or shepherds, teachers, evangelists. So pastor basically means shepherds, those who have the heart of a shepherd to shepherd the flock. And in a church, there should be uh, many people who, sh who should have the heart of a shepherd to guide the younger flock at all. Not just the elders, but even uh, people who are growing up to be mature in the church should have the heart of a shepherd and it is not a title uh, we do not read for <laughs> appointing pastors in the churches but rather elders in the churches so when we looked look to the word and cling to the word then uh, we will know that many things that are practiced in many churches not to blame them but uh, you know we, we want to stick close to the word of God and obey the word Mm, that's why uh, even when uh, actually those who are those who call themselves pastors also i try to address them as sir or even brother if i have that freedom but uh, if they feel if i feel that they would be offended if i call them brother then i'll uh, call them uh, sir and uh, if they are really angry to me i take the liberty to call them their names also <laughs> you know according to the freedom so you know uh, so, I mean, because actually they are not pastor to me. They are not my shepherd. They are not shepherding me. If I, you know, a person from a Bible college comes and says that I am pastor so and so, if I'm calling him pastor, you know, I have to be, <laughs> I should not use any idle word. No? So every idle word you have to give an account in the day of Jesuit Romans, Matthew 12, 36, 37. So if I'm calling somebody pastor, he should be a pastor to me, but he is not my pastor. So then how can I call him a pastor? <laughs> He uses the title pastor, and even actually, this uh, uh, denominational churches, there there is this title father, and all. Uh, and as much as possible, I uh, try to avoid calling that, and I uh, call them, address them as sir, and all. And uh, some uh, one person I remember, he <laughs> told specifically, doctor, why why do you call me sir? You call me acha. <laughs> then I said, sir, sir. And then I again called him not father, but sir. <laughs> Matthew twenty three eight to twelve, you read, sir. I shouldn't call anybody father. So then you call your earthly dad your father. Uh, so then I said, uh, among the brethren, actually Jesus is telling the disciples, among yourself, call, don't call anybody. Everybody among those who are believing, so don't call the you know, of course, in the home you call your dad, your father, or acha, or appa, or appacha. But uh, among your brethren, among the church uh, brethren, brothers and sisters, don't call anybody father or rabbi uh, or teacher or leader, but even not even uh, reverend and wrong reverend and right reverend and most reverend and holy reverend and all. Uh, you know, actually in KJV, only one place that word reverend is used and uh, that is uh, denoting God himself. Uh, there in Psalm 111, as I remember, uh, you know, in, in NSB that word is not used. But actually it is the word that is used for God. Yeah, Psalm 111 verse 9. Holy and awesome is his name. In uh, KJV it is written, uh, holy and reverend is his name. That reverend is only for and that is the uh, the word that is used for god and uh, people are taking that uh, rev and as titles and all and we are not looking around upon them but we do not agree with them and uh, 
uh, of course i can understand some people who are studying in this kind of catholic institutions or something of course as students and all they may not be able to <laughs> you know call the priest their sir and uh, god understands all that but as much as possible uh, you know not to uh, actually it is our intention is not to really offend but rather to stand for the word of god we uh, in one way we do not seek to please any man uh, philippians 110 if i seek to please man i cannot be a bond servant of god but the same paul says in first corinthians 10:31 that i seek to please all men <laughs> and romans 15:2 also says please all men so we were i think even in our english meeting we were saying that difference actually uh, in our self there is a temptation to please people according to our own self or our own um, gain or uh, you know we want to please them to become popular and to flatter them or anything like that so that kind of pleasing we shouldn't please uh, in, uh, anybody uh, especially when it is uh, especially if, uh, we have to take a stand for the word of god so we shouldn't please man in that sense from ourselves but you know spirit the holy spirit gives us the nature of god the life of god and the life of god is that pleases all men that means actually we are like servants to uh, people and we serve them and uh, we want to respect them we want to honor honor all men first peter 217 says honor all men so we honor everybody <laughs> so that is that balance and even last monday also we were seeing that uh, the other, other another contrast actually <laughs> you know uh, the you know another apparent paradox uh, apparent contradiction it is not a contradiction but Uh, it is an apparent contradiction or a apparent paradox that is uh, mark 10 41 jesus says you should be a slave of all <laughs> uh, so if you turn to mark 10 uh, verse 44 rather sorry mark 10 44 who wishes to be first among you shall be slave of all so we should be we we uh, we want to become first in the kingdom of heaven we want to uh, that means actually we want to cling closest to the lord in eternity not for our selfish interest but uh, then we have to be slave of all uh, and even second corinthians 5 also says the same thing second uh, corinthians 4 rather second corinthians 4 5 second corinthians 4 5 for we do not preach ourselves but christ jesus as lord and ourselves as your born servants for jesus sake so uh, we are not only jesus born servants paul is saying we are your born servants also for jesus sake so i am a servant for you all but the same paul says in, then what is the paradox uh, same paul says in first corinthians 7:23 first corinthians 723 you were bought with a price do not become slaves of men <laughs> so in one place it says slave be a slave of all people this is says they uh, and uh, even the apostle paul also says we are your bond servants second corinthians 4 5 but the same paul says here in first corinthians 723 uh, do not become slaves of men so you know actually that is the same thing uh, like pleasing people i mean um from our self from our flesh i mean if we delineate between our spirit soul and this self life which is demarcating self life uh self life or self or flesh that is a thick veil which is partitioning this spirit and soul most holy place and the holy place and from our self there is this tendency to become slave of other people and to please other people and to i not to offend even if god is offended i do not want to offend you you know young people want to please their friends and they go after the world and dishonor the lord's name so in that sense do not become a slave of men from yourself uh, there is a temptation to become people servants and uh, to please them uh, to for you know your own gain and uh, to uh, what to say that is from the self there is a pleasing tendency that is a uh, what to say an attitude of servitude uh, that means actually becoming uh, subservient to uh, people just to please them and to uh, get their favor and all so that sense do not be a slave of men galatians 1 do not please men but 
uh, Jesus is there in Ma um, Mark 10, 44. Uh, be slave of all. That means actually I'm a zero and I'm willing to serve anybody so that I would please them and so that I can gain them for the Lord. And that is what, you know, the both the verses where Paul says, please all men. Paul is saying, one in 1 Corinthians 10, 30, Three, First Corinthians 10, 33, just as I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, seeking, pleasing people to seek my own profit is Galatians 1 to that I should not do. But but the profit of the many so that they may be saved and pleasing the unbelievers in from my spirit. That means actually the life of God is guiding me to please them, honoring them and respecting them and serving them and doing good to them and blessing them. So that I can save them, I can attract them to the Lord, and I can give them the gospel that they would be, they would come to the Lord. And if they are already God's children, why am I pleasing them? Romans 15 2 says that Romans 15 2, each one of us is to please his neighbor in the context of the church unity in Christ. It is uh, you know, that is a theme over there. Who are those who are strong? Um, verse 1, Romans 15, 1. Those now we who are strong ought to bear the weaknesses of those without strength and not just please ourselves. We should be pleasing ourselves, uh, but we should please his neighbor for his good to his edification. If you're already a believer, if he is an believer, I'm pleasing him from my spirit with the life of Jesus to you know to uh, make him feel at home and to serve him and to. Uh, uh, you know, win his heart for the Lord that he might be saved. And if he's already a saved person also, I want to please him so that he would be edified. He would be built up spiritually, that he would be encouraged in the Lord. Uh, you know, I'm honoring them and uh, we are respectful, respectfully greeting others. Uh, that is not a pleasing from ourself. Uh, you know, some people, um, you know, say that, oh, flattery is bad. So I shouldn't speak any good about anybody before them. <laughs> so that is actually, you know, the, Jesus didn't do that. <laughs> you know, of course, flattery, we shouldn't do. Flattery is actually just for pleasing uh, somebody, just to say something which are not real. And even if it is real, just to, for selfish gain, somebody is doing something that is flattery. But actually, there is a sincere appreciation. Jesus was verbose or very lavish in his appreciation <laughs> this was said to peter flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you but my father in heaven he was telling before all the other disciples and uh, matthew 16 we read that and to nathaniel he said oh here is a man in whom there is no guile uh, john 1 last verses we read there and he is telling the roman century oh matthew 8 I haven't seen greater faith than this in all of israel and even to the canaanite women uh, Serophoenician woman that we read in Matthew 15. Uh, have, I haven't seen uh, this kind of faith in all of Israel. And he was very, uh, you know, uh, expressive in his appreciation. So that is pleasing all men. That means actually it is not, uh, you know, telling from ourself, but rather telling from our spirit. You know, there is a, only of course, if we are guided by the spirit, <laughs> we'll be able to understand the difference, discern the difference. Uh, even while I'm a slave of everybody, I do not uh, please anybody from myself, but I please everybody from my spirit. That in the sense, actually, I please everybody from my spirit in the sense that the life of God is a uh, life of God, the spirit of God in me who imparts the life of Christ, the nature of Christ in me is, uh, is uh, uh, emanating the fragrance of Christ and I want to do good to them and I want to serve them and I want to make them comfortable. I want to consider them as more important than myself. Philippians 2, 2 and 3, consider others more important than yourself. That is actually pleasing others or serving others. So that is the uh, balance. Okay. So, I mean, that is the, you know, the I was telling about the Nicolaitans who lorded over other people. And uh, uh, yeah, so that's the, uh, that's why, you know, the real leaders are servants, but uh, even while being servants or even born slave, uh, they should be, they shouldn't be pleasing others from the self, but rather pleasing the Lord. And they should be strong enough to exercise authority. They would be gracious enough to exercise authority, but at the same time, it's, it's a mystery, actually. You know, the Christian life is actually a mystery. You know, we, when we uh, think from human standpoint, 
logical reasoning uh, all these things will become more confusing and apparent paradox and contradiction and, uh, and even if actually you know probably uh, the, you know the many of these muslim scholars and all find many contradictions apparent contradictions they are not contradictions but um, because they see only from a human standpoint they uh, you know these people and all they will uh, say about this contradiction that contradiction but we know as children of god it is not contradiction but rather complementary Uh, and uh, there are, that is the two sides of the same coin and only uh, god has revealed these to the babes has hidden these things from the wise and intelligent without wisdom and without human wisdom and intelligence we cannot understand or comprehend them but uh, we humble ourselves before the lord as a zero day. we will understand in our spirit and knowledge in our soul realm makes us arrogant but knowledge in our spirit that means knowing the lord jesus in our spirit Uh, will edify us love edifies first uh, corinthians 8:1 knowledge makes arrogant and love edifies that means actually knowledge in the soul uh, that means just a brain knowledge that will make me more proud or i know this much but if i surrender to whatever the lord has revealed to me then uh, i'll be flooded by the spirit the holy spirit sheds abroad the floods the love of god in my heart romans 5 5 and that love edifies builds me up in my inner man and makes me stronger spiritually so that is the the yeah about the teaching of nicolaitans and all and therefore repent otherwise uh, you know uh, i will make war against them with the sword of my mouth all these people are teaching all these false teachings in the church you are not taking the sword the uh, if you are not if you do not repent and begin to take the sword of the word of god and exercise authority a uh, godly authority in the church to uh, uh, you know to preach against all these false practices in the church and expose the wrong to- uh, teaching then i will have to come this is it. i like to come and make war against them with the sword of my mouth i like to uh, raise up a uh, real man of god who preach the to a sword who will wage war against the these false teachings uh, and um, he who was in here let him hear what the spirit says to the church so when the when it is read out in the church the holy spirit is expecting some at least some in the church to respond to the his prompting and responding to the spirit's call oh lord i i need to repent and uh, and the lord will the, those who humble themselves the lord will exalt and the lord will uh, raise some uh, people to if that elder is not repenting somebody else the lord will exalt and uh, raise up to proclaim the true word of god and to him who overcomes verse 17 to him i will give some of the hidden manna and uh, we were seeing the last so many weeks about the hidden manna uh, beyond the veil is the hidden manna in the most holy place exodus 16 last verses we saw uh, how moses was instructed to uh, keep some manna uh, in a jar in the most holy place which remained fresh throughout all the generation uh, in the during the journey in the wilderness but the manna kept outside the most holy place anywhere else it bred worms within a day within 24 hours so from that we understand that the manna that is the word of god jesus is the manna jesus is the living bread jesus said i am the bread of life john 6:48 and um, we need to have that revelation of the word in our spirit Uh, if it is just in the knowledge realm it will breed worms it will be spiritual death you know uh, you know some people who will be uh, what to say exhibiting their bible knowledge to prove that they are very great scholars and they know this that and the other and it is just like you know, kind of a show of kind of things i know i am such a great theologian i am such a great scholar in the word of god but uh, like the pharisees uh, you know that is not the fragrance of christ jesus knew the bible more than all those pharisees right there was a fragrance of christ there was an aroma of christ when jesus preached that spiritual authority and uh, so that uh, that is a hidden manna that is the revelation of the word of god in our spirit we are experiencing the word of god in our spirit and uh, we are preaching from what we have experienced as the word of god then only we can minister from our spirit and so to those who overcome to those who overcome the self life Uh, basically what is to be overcome the self or the flesh and the world and the devil the devil is trying to 
uh, instigate our flesh through the world system. Devil, world, and our flesh is there. Flesh is the tick wheel. So the devil, the ruler of the world, First John 5, 19 and John 14, 30, says about ruler of the world. Even Second Corinthians 4 also, Second uh, Corinthians 4, 4 also, Paul is saying that ruler of the world is uh, has blinded the minds of the unbelieving. God of this world, God of this world, it is written over there. Second Corinthians 4.4. 4. In which case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving. So the God of this world, that is the ruler of the world is coming, Jesus says in John 14 verse 30, 30. And First John 5.19 says that the whole world is under the power of the evil one. So the evil one, the devil, through the world system, world system, first John 2.16, lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh and pride of life is provoking the corresponding lust in our flesh, lust and desires in our flesh. We, in our flesh, there is lust and desires. Galatians 5.24 says that those who belong to Christ Jesus have, have crucified the flesh with its lust and desires. So the lust and desires, that means what are the lust and desires? Lust of the flesh, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. In our flesh is corresponding receptors of the in lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, pride of life are there in the world and the corresponding receptors are there in our that corresponding lust are there in our flesh also and uh, the devil through many people and many circumstances and all uh, will be provoking uh, this lust in our flesh and if we yield to that lust when that flaming arrow of the evil one is coming uh, then the lust conceives and there will be sin. James 1, 14, 15, we saw that. The sin as a child is born and the sin, when it becomes complete, when it becomes mature, uh, it will bring forth death. That is what we read there. Uh, James 1, uh, when, it, when the sin is accomplished, uh, James 1, 15, uh, it brings forth death. But instead of yielding to the flaming arrow of the evil one, that tempting thoughts and uh, thoughts of unforgiveness and thoughts of pride and thoughts of selfishness and thoughts of um, looking down on others and thoughts of judging others, thoughts of anxiety, thoughts of discouragement. Instead of giving in to those flaming arrows of the evil one, if we give ourselves to the imperishable seed of the word of God, First Peter 123. And we saw that uh, word for seed is pora in Greek. And from that root word only, the word sperm comes. So the imperishable seed of the word of God is uh, the Lord wants to speak to us. And if we yield to that word in humility, James 1, uh, James 1, 15, we saw the sin child being born. And then uh, verse 18, Christ can be born in us. That is what is uh, written over there. James 1.18, when we became born again, Christ is born. Our inner man uh, is created according to the image of Christ. That is what we read in Colossians 3.10. Of course, you know, I'm taking so many verses, but uh, most of you would be familiar with these verses. Colossians 3.10 uh, have put on the new self who is being renewed with true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. God has created have a new self according to his image. And uh, we need to put, uh, th that is the uh, new spirit that uh, God has given us, new human spirit, the new inner man that the Lord has given us when we became born again. And Ephesians 4, verse 24, put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in uh, righteousness. God, you know, there is a creation that has happened when we became born again. Uh, those who are in Christ is a new creation. Second Corinthians 5.17. So here in Ephesians 4.24, put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in uh, righteousness and holiness of the truth. In Genesis 1.3, God said, let there be light. There was a creation. And the same God who said, let there be light. Second Corinthians 4. 6 says that the same God who said, let there be light has shown in our hearts also to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. So just as there was creation in Genesis 1, there is a creation, new creation when we became born again. God said, let there be light. And there was light in our hearts, light of Jesus, light of the life of Jesus through the Holy Spirit. When we 
yielded to the imperishable seed of the word, word of God through which we were born again as first Peter 123 says and we became born again but we need to have more of the life of Christ we need to have life and life in abundance John 10 10 so he uh, had we began to have life then we became born again then we need to have abundant life and that is also the same process uh, just like we yielded to the word of God in the beginning like that we need to keep yielding ourselves to the word of God we saw that verse in Colossians last week also Colossians 3 6 where we read therefore as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord so walk in him as you have received Christ Jesus that same way you walk in the Lord just as you receive Christ like that you keep on receiving Christ keep on receiving the word of God that is what we read in James 1 21 therefore putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of the wickedness that is the flesh you surrender that flesh that self with all its lust and desire to the to a sword of the word of God uh, and in humility you are surrendering yourself as a zero yeah your self will is being surrendered that means according to the life that you have you are becoming a zero before the lord in humility receive the word the word of god the imperishable seed of the word of god implanted in our spirit and when the word of god is implanted in our spirit that word is able to save our souls that means actually there is uh, more of a soul our soul comprises of a mind emotions and decisions so more of a mind more of our emotions and more of our decisions would become uh, sanctified that is salvation of the soul salvation of the spirit has happened during a new birth experience salvation of the body will happen when christ comes back and salvation of the soul is happening today sanctification justification sanctification glorification past present future salvation from the penalty of sin or punishment of sin salvation from the uh, from the power of sin and salvation from the presence of sin when jesus comes back so in humility receive the word implanted uh, just like uh, you know when we have said about that even the prior in the previous bible uh, bible studies also just like uh, sperm and ovum unites uh, in the uterus in the womb to become a zygote like that uh, the word of god with the power of the holy spirit unites with our spirit uh, and the life of christ is formed over there and uh, uh, we receive more of the life of god when we keep on receiving the word of god and uh, when we keep on surrendering ourselves to the word of God in humility, we receive that word, just like Mary said, Luke 1 30, be it unto me, behold the bond slave of the Lord, be it unto me, according to your word, Lord. Your word says so, Lord, I won't obey that. Your word says, do not be anxious for anything. Your word says, do not be angry. Your word says, do not lust with your lust even in your heart. Your word says, uh, let not sin rule over me. Your word says, do everything without complaining or murmuring your word says do not judge according to appearance your word says judge with righteous judgment <laughs> john 7 24. so when lord when your word says like that i surrender to your word i receive that word in humility when i am tempted with the flaming arrows of the evil one uh, in whatever area lust of the flesh lust of the eyes pride of life there lord as a living sacrifice i'm surrendering myself so that i can receive the word of god in my spirit the spirit or heart is the uh, womb where the life of Jesus is born and is maturing. And uh, Paul is saying uh, in Galatians 4 19, I am again in birth thanks for you till Christ is formed in you. Christ is already, uh, Christ is already uh, is growing in you, but the form of Christ, uh, we are not. Uh, I am not seeing in you, o Galatians. You know, that word is uh, marfavo. And from that word only, morphing and all comes. Morphology, morpho. Uh, we know that word, morph, uh, marfavo, to form. Marfe means form or external appearance. So the appearance of Christ, I am not seeing in you, Galatian Christians. You are very immature. Uh, Christ is in you because you are born again. So the life of Christ is there. Right? It's just like the embryo 
uh, and the fetus uh, in the earlier stages of pregnancy, the fetus would be looking like more of a tadpole rather than a human being <laughs> with a large head and smaller limbs and all. So you're not looking like Christ. Uh, so I'm again in birth banks as a spiritual mother, praying for you and admonishing you and correcting you, encouraging you so that Christ would be formed in you. You will receive more of the word of God and you will receive more of the life of Christ and Christ would be, you'll be edified, built up in your spirit and Christ would be formed in you. The form of Christ uh, would be evident in you so that others would see no longer you who live, but Christ living in you. That is Paul's testimony in the same Galatians 2.20. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Everybody who sees me is seeing Christ because I'm clothed with Christ. Romans 13.14 says that, clothe yourself with Christ. And even the same Galatians 3.27 says, all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There the baptism is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Because just with water baptism, nobody is clothed with Christ. <laughs> Uh, in water baptism, we are burying the old man, which was the old mindset to continue in sin. But in Holy Spirit baptism, we are burying the flesh, the self. It means uh, when the Holy Spirit comes upon us as a mantle, as a clothing, uh, our uh, flesh is buried. It means actually people are not seeing the deeds of our flesh in our words or in our looks or in our contact, in our behavior. But they are seeing the, uh, the Holy Spirit who has come into our spirit and is overflowing from our spirit uh, and flooding our soul. And through our body, the, it, is the, it is just like a cup is overflowing. And uh, you are not seeing the cup, only the water which is gushing out you are seeing. <laughs> so like that cup uh, is not seen. Uh, that means actually that uh, uh, that uh, earthen vessel is broken down into pieces. It is that veil is being rent and it is the spirit which is gushing for the life of Christ which is evident. And uh, Jesus said in Luke 24, 48, 49, Luke 24, 49, uh, without clothing you do not go out. <laughs> Now recently, we were saying that in a church meeting, I was sharing that in the church meeting also, Luke 24, 49, to little children, we say that little children who are just, you know, they're not mature, they do not know that they have to be clothed before they go out. So they, we said that without proper clothing, you do not go out uh, like that. Jesus is saying, because uh, the disciples were spiritually immature at that time, so you need to be clothed. What is the clothing? Luke 24, 49, and behold, I am sending for the promise of my father upon you. And you are to stay in the city. It is the city of Jerusalem. They were at Mount Olives that time. Uh, you know, just uh, verse 50. He led them out as far as Bethany. Bethany is at the foot of Mount Olives. And from Mount Olives, this is ascending. Acts 1, we read there. So in that city, Bethany and Jerusalem are so close by here to stay in the city of Jerusalem. Uh, and until you are clothed with power from on high, until you are clothed, endued. Endue is the Greek word, to sink into clothing, to put on, clothe oneself. The same endue is the word that Jesus used in Matthew 6, when Jesus said, how much more the Father will clothe you uh, if the, the uh, lilies of the field are clothed like this, how much more the Heavenly Father will clothe you. The same word endue is used uh, the, Jesus, uh, the Holy Spirit is using here in Luke 24, 49, you'll be clothed with power. That is the Holy Spirit will be like a mantle, like a cloth. Then you'll be baptized in the, when you're immersed in the Holy Spirit, others who see, uh, see you won't be seeing you, but rather the gushing forth of the Holy Spirit. That means actually the life of Christ. In, uh, the, in, in the baptism, the old man is buried. That is what we read in Romans 6. Uh, we couldn't go to Tayatara yet, actually. We're still in Pergamum. <laughs> so <laughs> I thought of moving to, you know, in our tour from Ephesus to Smyrna to <laughs> Pergamum. <laughs> we thought of moving to Tayatara, the next station. But uh, uh, but actually, the Lord is not allowing us. <laughs> so uh, 
we, we read that in Romans uh, 6 actually the old man <laughs> the old man um, is being buried you know there is this old man and the flesh many people confuse it to be the same I understood the difference between that from Brother Zach only uh, even Brother Zach himself I have heard that <laughs> I heard him saying that you know uh, no theologians uh, would explain the difference between old man and the flesh although the Bible makes it clear many people think it to be the same uh, verse 6, Romans 6, 6, knowing that our old self, that old man was crucified with him. Old man, you know, what is the difference between a person who is truly born again and not born again? A person who is truly born again uh, doesn't want to sin anymore. Even a single sin, he doesn't want to do. If he's truly born again, he doesn't want to do any sin. But a person who is not born again, he wants to, he enjoys, he wants to do indulgence. But um, uh, what has died in that person who is truly born again, that old mindset to continue in sin, to sin again, that is an old man, that is an old mindset, old man. That has already been crucified. Our old man has already been cru crucified when Jesus was on the cross. In him, our old man was also crucified. That is what we read here in Romans 6, 6. In order that, why that old man is crucified? In order that the body of sin, that is actually uh, this flesh, uh, that the self might be done away with. Done away with uh, meaning that uh, word, Used, of the, used over there is hoplon. That means, um, yeah, not hoplon, the hoplon is another word used over there. Done away with is katargio. Uh, katargio <laughs> uh, means render idle, inactive, cause to have no further efficiency, deprive of force, influence of power. Uh, argio means to be idle, inactive. Argos means free from labor, lazy. Uh, Kata means down or according to. That means put an end to. Katargio means actually our body of sin would be powerless, would be rendered powerless or wouldn't be functioning anymore. That means our flesh wouldn't be active anymore. Uh, that is why the Lord crucified the old flesh, the old man on the cross. Uh, every day, so that every day we would surrender our self. And that is surrender ourselves means crucify yourself when we take up the cross every day and walk. Uh, we are not crucifying the old man. Old man has already died in a truly born again person. And in baptism, we are burying that old man. That is what we read there in verse 4. Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism. Uh, and uh, uh, buried with him through baptism into death so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in the newness of life and and then verse 6 says about the old self was crucified so what 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 are we burying in baptism it is the old man it is the old mindset it is just like a dead body has to be buried a person who is truly that's why we shouldn't uh, baptize a person who is not truly born again <laughs> in infant baptism doesn't have any meaning it is just a bathing only because a person is an infant or even if he is an adult also if he is not born again truly or if he has taken baptism before he became assured of the, about the salvation also, uh, after he becomes uh, becomes assured, of, assured about the salvation, he needs to take the adult immersion baptism. Uh, because then only the old man has died. Uh, that old man only we are burying in the water. And the new man is resurrecting. The new man is already there in our life when we become born again. But in baptism, we are testifying that the old man has been buried. And the new man has been raised up. So that uh, we would walk in the newness of life. How we can walk in the newness of life? If we put the body of sin, that is actually this flesh, to death every day. If we walk according to the spirit and not according to the flesh. So the, the old man is the old mindset of continuing sin. Flesh is that storehouse of all our lusts and desires. That is basically our self-will with all its lusts and desires, which we need to crucify daily. Crucify means not by gritting our teeth, but by just humbling ourselves and surrendering ourselves totally to the Lord, so that the Spirit will put to death the deeds of the body. That is what we read in Romans 8.13. If by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. So Galatians 3.27 says about baptism. So they 
uh, you know the holy spirit similar words we read in first corinthians 12 13 also first corinthians 12 13 there also we read about the holy spirit baptism first corinthians 12 13 for by one spirit we were all baptized into one body so there is a holy spirit baptism whether jews or greek whether slaves or when we became born again god has baptized into the body of the universal body of christ uh, we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free. Uh, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. So that is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has come into a person who is truly born again. So we were all baptized, immersed, baptized. Actually, basically, it has to be translated immersed, baptized. The word is a transliteration, which the KJV translators invented. <laughs> they transliterated. Uh, you know, they invented a new word, coined a new word, you know, not often the King James, who instructed them not to, uh, what to say, not to touch the traditions of the Church of England. Uh, so they feared the king. Uh, they had, uh, they were uh, God-fearing uh, persons. That's why they didn't uh, translate sprinkle water, but they invented a new word cleverly. <laughs> But there was a scheme of the devil, uh, you know, that's why many people, even today, those who are born again, they remain in denom denominational churches and they do not obey God's word by taking the immersion baptism and all. So, and, um, you know, so much of confusion uh, through all this in infant baptism and all, so many practices and all those things and all, um, you know, the denominational churches have, uh, uh, you know, brought to the Babylonian Christianity and all. So here in First Corinthians 12, 13, uh, so First Corinthians 12, uh, 13, we read about the Holy Spirit baptism. And when that baptism takes place in our life daily, uh, that means actually the Holy Spirit floods our spirit and overflows uh, into a soul and a body and a whole being is immersed in the Holy Spirit. It is like a clothing. And we are clothed with Christ. When we are clothed with the Holy Spirit, we are clothed with Christ. That is Romans 13, 14 says about put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And even Colossians 3, 10 says about put on love, uh, put on uh, compassion and all, you know, uh, Colossians 3, Colossians 3, 10, put on the new self. And then uh, verse 12, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, that is the life of Christ. Uh, the nature of Christ, compassion, kindness, all this comes as part of the, uh, you know, as fruit of the spirit, compassion, kindness, humility, uh, gentleness, and patience, uh, bearing with one another, forgiving each other, uh, and beyond all this, put on love, verse 14. So those who are seeing you are seeing the love of Christ. It is just like the bride saying in the Song of Solomon, uh, I have come into the banquet hall and the, his banner over me is love. Of course, there are songs and hymns with that phrase, his with that clause. His banner over me is love. You know, if somebody has covered me with a big banner, I'm completely clothed with one banner and those who see will only see the banner. <laughs> they will say, see, a banner is working. <laughs> so they are only seeing the banner. So uh, Song of Songs actually... Yeah, two, four. He has brought me to his banquet hall and his banner over me is love. <laughs> and when the Lord is uh, clothing me with the love through the baptism in the Holy Spirit and flooded with his love and the love is overflowing in my uh, thoughts and uh, emotions and decisions and it is ex being expressed in my attitudes and motives and thoughts and words. Um, and deeds, then others who see me will be seeing the love of Christ. And of course, there is a strictness of Christ also in that love. So we are putting the kindness and compassion and all we are putting on Christ. And uh, that's why Galatians 3, 27, we read that those who have, those who have baptized Galatians uh, 3, 27, all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. And uh, that is the clothing that the Lord wants us to have. <laughs> you know, that's why uh, Jesus says there to the disciples, without this clothing, you do not go out. You stay in the city till you are clothed with power from on high. Just like actually, you know, humanly speaking, we know that we uh, we need to have clothes before we present it before others. Uh, spiritually, we need to be clothed with the 
power of the holy spirit otherwise actually the shame of the nakedness actually the uh, shame of uh, you know unchrist likeness would be seen to others if you are not filled with the holy spirit because of you the name of christ is being blasphemed among the gentiles romans 2 24 25 because without the clothing uh, christians are walking around without the clothing of the spirit of christ uh, they are not clothed with christ others are seeing their flesh only and the shame of the nakedness is revealed that's why we need to have the belt of truth to keep the clothing intact we, you know the in those days they will be uh, wearing ro- long robes and all they will be having belt to keep that clothes intact and in the whole armor of god belt of truth is there and that is the same uh, dress at uh, that jesus also has we saw that in revelation 1 about clothed in a robe reaching to the feet verse 13 and uh, girded across his chest with a glo- golden sash golden girdle a golden belt it's a gold and it's a divine belt a golden uh, gold denotes divine origin and golden girdle uh, that means actually truthfulness and uh, you know if we are untruthful in our money matters and in our dealing with others the shame of our nakedness would be revealed because the the clothing that the lord has given us uh, the holy spirit's covering it is not uh, you know it is uh, that is a bridal that forms a bridal garment actually uh, the uh, that is a priestly garment that is a bridal garment that is a armor whole armor of god and we need that belt of truth otherwise revelation 16 Uh, revelation 16 15 says that behold i am coming like a thief coming like a thief at a time which nobody expects blessed is the one who stays awake and keeps his cloth because he has the belt so he is keeping his clothes so that he will not walk about naked and men will see men will not see his shame and even to the laodicean elder in revelation 3 uh they we read in verse uh is 17 that you are who are blind and naked you do not have clothes the spiritual cloth is not there the lord has given us the robe of righteousness when we became born again and uh, over this robe of righteousness this righteousness has the righteousness that is imputed into us has to be imparted into our spirit daily as we walk the way of the cross otherwise we will turn to be spiritually naked then uh, the lord is saying verse 18 what is the remedy you buy from me gold refined by fire that you may become rich because you are poor the true spiritual riches you need the real life of christ in your spirit and that has to overflow us white garments the life of christ in our spirit has to overflow if the cup uh, is cleansed from the inside uh, the holy spirit life is flooding our hearts and it is overflowing and it forms the white it forms the white garments so that you may clothe yourself uh, and that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed that is the white garments through the fullness of the spirit the life of christ is overflowing and the eye cell because you are blind you need the eye cell to anoint your eyes to see th- see things from a heavenly perspective as jesus would see uh, and to have revelation on the word of god to see and read the word of god understand the word of god as uh god has inspired that word god, god has breathed into that word and so that is why we need to uh, overcome all this uh, overcome the self life and the world and the devil and uh, then we'll have the uh, will uh, i will give off the hidden manna that uh, some uh, is written in italics there in revelation 2:17 uh, so i will give off the hidden manna jesus himself is the hidden manna and of jesus more and more of jesus will more and more of the manna we will get that of that apo is that word used over the apo means separation of that is a preposition there so he, i will give off the hidden manna and i will give him a white stone and a new name written on the stone uh, which no one knows but he who receives it there is a bridal intimacy bride bridegroom intimacy with uh, with us and the lord which we cannot explain in words to others uh, when 
I say my Jesus uh, when uh, Paul says uh, my Lord <laughs> Galatians 2 20 we just referred to uh, it is no longer I who live but Christ who lives in me then what does he say Galatians 2 20 uh, the life which I now live in the flesh I live by faith in the son of God who loved me so you will ask Paul, why are you saying Paul loved you? It is as if only you, the, uh, Jesus loved the whole world, Jesus loved, no? And Paul says, yeah, that's true, but uh, it's so personal to me. He loved me and gave himself up for me. It was for me. Even if there were no other sinner on the whole face of the world, Jesus loves me in such a, with such an intensity and fervor that he would have come down to love, die for me. And he loved me. I am the apple of his eye. I am the bride of Christ. He loves me so specially and uniquely uh, that there is an intimacy with the Lord Jesus. That is a new name which no one else knows. That means actually it is not literally some new name, but <laughs> it's a symbolic language of an intimacy. Just like a, a truly loving husband and wife will have some secrets between them which they do not want to tell others even the even children <laughs> uh, so like that uh, even the same Paul, so he says uh, yeah even the same paul says that in philippians 3 philippians 3 8 more than all more than that i count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing christ jesus my lord for whom i have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish that I may gain Christ. So he is, Christ is my Lord. Uh, you know, surpassing value, surpassing that uh, in KJV it says the excellency of knowing uh, of knowing Christ. Excellency of the knowledge of Christ. So surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. That a surpassing value huperako uh, huperako, that is the word used of the to excel to be superior to surpass so i want to know jesus uh the 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 value of knowing christ jesus knowing christ jesus is that bridal intimacy uh knowing the lord that knowing the lord uh, denotes a husband wife relationship also the same gnosko mary is using in luke 1 but in nasb it is not clear actually in malayalam it is there it is clear but uh, uh, in KJV also it's clear, but NASB has uh, kind of paraphrased it, unfortunately. Uh, Luke 1, 34, Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I am a virgin? But actually the uh, literal translation should be since I do not know a man. And Purushan is the same as the Verse 34, Luke 1, 34. So knowing a man, so you know that... Uh, Meaning is communicated, but they have paraphrased it, although NASB claims to be literal translation. And of course, we know that we are so grateful for the NASB translation, but uh, you know, some deficits are there. Uh, how can this be since I do not know a man? So knowing a man, that is that uh, denotes that, uh, you know, husband-wife relationship and all. Uh, how can I become pregnant? Because I do not know him, and it's what uh, Mary is saying over there that gnosco, gnosco, gnosis, diagnosis, prognosis. That is, uh, you know, Jesus says to uh, so many people there in Matthew 7 23, 22, 23, they, they're saying that we have prophesied in your name, we have done many miracles in your name, we have healed in your name. Jesus says, I never knew you. I didn't have a knowing relationship. And I never knew you. That means you never were born again at all. Uh, but you had some, you know, all these uh, uh, kind of doings that you had. And you used Christ's name to propagate yourself. That's all. And Matthew 25, verse 1 to 13. Uh, five wife, wise virgins and five foolish virgins. To the foolish virgins, this is saying, I do not know you. Not that I never knew you. I knew you at one point of time when you had oil in the lamp and fire. After some time, the oil is not there. You do not have love in your hearts. Only that external testimony is there. And mm, you do not, in your hidden life, there is no faithfulness. There is no hidden manna. Hidden manna is not there. That oil in a lamp is hidden. People only see the lamp, the light burning. So in your hidden life, there is nothing of substantial value. They do not have a 
quiet time with the lord all they have is so just attending some meetings going there and doing some religious things uh, but they do not have a secret personal walk with the lord a bridal intimacy with the lord so that's why jesus says, i knew you once upon a time uh, but you are still a virgin you are foolish not foolish harlots but you are foolish virgins only matthew 25 but uh, you have you have been gone after the world into harlotry but actually you do not know me any longer so uh, i have come to take my bride and i do not know you uh, and uh, you know such a sad state of affairs actually uh, i do not know whether these people they matthew 25 uh, but he answered i do not know uh, i do not know you matthew 25 verse 12 and beyond the alert then that for you do not know the day or the hour it is just uh, yeah so yeah so this foolish virgins because they were virgins they didn't have the oil jesus says i do not know you i do not know <laughs> whether they would end up as the 60 fold and 30 fold harvest people in heaven itself but uh, but not as a bride jesus is coming to take his bride uh, the hundredfold harvest people who knows the lord would be the bride blessed are the ones those who invited for the marriage supper of the lamb revelation 19 7 those who invited are they in heaven not the bride doesn't have to be invited so the bride of christ is there who knows the lord beyond the veil through the way of the cross but there is the 64 100 full house a 64 30 full half star also jesus says in matthew 13 parable that means actually they are saved but all their works were burnt up uh first corinthians 3 12 to 15 we read that wood hay and straw everything was burnt up all their works uh just they themselves are saved so door is shut over there but we do not uh see that they are cast out into the outer darkness as he says in the other parables you know in the other parable matthew 24 51 and all uh, they will be in that place where they will be weeping and gnashing of teeth but we do not see this foolish virgins being cast out into a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth and all so i have a feeling i don't know <laughs> uh, so they might be there in heaven but uh, they won't be the bride of christ they won't be sitting with the bridegroom only the bride will be sitting with the bridegroom you know if we are invited to a wedding we won't go and sit with the <laughs> bride or bridegroom over there in the stage uh, in that throne <laughs> you know only the bride it is reserved for the bride and the bridegroom so when jesus wedding wedding of the lamb is there only the bride would be sitting with the bridegroom and for whom is the that seat reserved jesus says in revelation 3 21 revelation 3 17 18 we just saw the message to the lover this in elder and revelation 3 21 we read to the same <laughs> we think that what is a hopeless church because jesus didn't have anything to uh, appreciate in them there is only church where jesus didn't have anything to appreciate uh, but uh, to such worst church among all those seven Jesus is giving <laughs> a very best promise. Re Revelation 3, 21. Even with this, in this apparently hopeless condition, my son, my daughter, in this Revelation church, you elder in that church, although you are blind and naked and poor, now you repent. Verse 19, and I'm uh, knocking at the door of your heart. Verse 20, and uh, he who overcomes, overcomes this self-life, that is this flesh and the world and the devil, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne. Oh, as my bride. Oh, what a great honor. Even if we have failed empty number of times in our life, even if we have been unfaithful in our past life, but still if we repent today radically and wholeheartedly, uh, Acts 17.30 says that the Lord is overlooking the days of ignorance and is commanding everyone to repent. Acts 17 verse 30, 30. So he overlooks the days of ignorance in his mercy. And uh, if he really genuinely repent, we can still be an overcomer, pass, go through the veil and know the Lord Jesus as our bridegroom and receive the hidden manna and the white stone. And 
Uh, so here we read that, uh, you know, to sit down with me on my throne as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Jesus also overcame and sat with his father. And if we overcome, then we'll be sitting with the throne. That is, that's why uh, only the overcomers will be part of the bride of Christ. Not all the born again believers, of course, there will be many believers who would have lost their salvation, would be ending up in hell where there is gnashing of teeth and all. Matthew 24, the last parable we saw just now. They were uh, servants in the household. They were born again. They were, had some responsibility in the church to preach the word also, but they flogged the servants. They will be in a place of gnashing and uh, gnashing, of, uh, gnashing of teeth and weeping. So they have lost their salvation and is there in the eternal hellfire. But there would be people, uh, 60 full house people and 30 full house people who overcome, but, uh, you know, 30% 30 for, 30 of their life only, they have surrendered to the Lord. 64% of their life only, they have surrendered to the Lord. But if you have, uh, you know, in spite of our repeated failures, with perseverance, that is what we read in Luke 8, 15, with perseverance, they bore fruit to maturity about the good seed, about the seed that fell on the good soil. And then we can be, we can have an intimacy with the Lord, let us say having a new name written on the white stone, which nobody else knows. That white stone, you know, the worldly fiancies are given some rings with white stone. Uh, and this is using that allegory here. Of course, as Christians who uh, do not encourage ornaments and all, we do not use these rings and all, white stone and all, but this is using that allegory. Uh, you know, the Bible is against the external adornment as we already saw some weeks ago in First Peter 3 and all. Uh, although it is not a sin to have an ornament, but uh, it is part of a simple living. Uh, and we are not here to judge others who do that. You know, God sees their hearts uh, for, you know, probably God wouldn't have given them light about that or whatever. But it is a peripheral thing uh, where people can have their own freedom. Uh, we are not imposing that upon other people. But uh, God looks at the heart where we are not, uh, we do not have that ornaments as an idol. Even Jesus says the parable in, in Luke 15, the parable of the prodigal son where Jesus, uh, where the father is giving the prodigal son a ring. <laughs> so there is an allegory uh, about the authority uh, that the father is giving to the younger son over there. Just like the Pharaoh gave a ring to uh, Joseph, we, we read in Genesis and all. So, uh, uh, you know, some people uh, say that, oh, Jesus himself is saying about this white stone and, uh, uh, you know, ring and all he is saying in the parable, then how can you say that uh, ornaments uh, and all? So, of course, actually, the allegory Jesus is using there, uh, you know, that song of songs, if we go through that, uh, Song of Songs, actually, even now we saw that verse, Song of Songs 2, for his banner over me is love, I am love sick, let his left hand be under my head and let his right hand embrace me. That's that intimacy that we should have with our spiritual heavenly bridegroom beyond the veil in the most holy place, which others won't be able to appraise. That is right. it says in uh, with that, I will close. Otherwise, we'll keep on. Of course, we do not have time to go till <laughs> Tayatira. Tayatira, God willing, we'll go next week. Uh, so here in First Corinthians 2, they're about the spiritual man. Yeah, spiritual man. First Corinthians 2, 15. He who is spiritual, that is uh, the really spiritually minded person in the spirit realm, uh, the bride-bridegroom relationship, appraises all things. He discerns all things. Yet he himself is appraised by no one. No one outside the holy, most holy place. That means those who are living in the soul realm and body realm, they won't be able to understand what these people are talking about intimacy with the Lord Jesus. And they will have some superficial intimacy kind of thing and all. But uh, they, uh, the others are not able to understand the depth of the walk uh, that the really spiritual people have with the Lord. And others would be amazed how, how these people can be so, uh, you know, so focused on the Lord. So, you know, whatever they say, whatever they do, everything they are doing for the Lord only, how can they be like that? They are appraised by no one. That is what we read in 1 Corinthians 2.15. And uh, so may the Lord help us to overcome the flesh and the uh, world and the devil so that we can 
perceive the hidden manna uh, you know jesus says i am uh, i am the one with the two s sword he uh, introduces himself as i am the one with a two s sword there to the church in pergamum revelation 2 uh, 12 one who has a sharp two s sword and if this sharp sharp two s sword falls on our self life and renting the veil the flesh the self in our life then beyond the veil we'll receive the hidden manna and that bridal intimacy uh and uh, the, you know if we overcome and overcome the self life the veil and go beyond that then we'll have the hidden manna there in the most holy place only is the tree of life also and there is the uh, uh, there is where we are not hurt by the second death even not even the spiritual death resultant of sin also so the overcomers are those who overcome the self and the world and the devil as has gone uh, beyond the veil to the most holy place into that real intimacy with the lord may the lord help us you know we can go into that most holy place only if we surrender ourselves fully in that golden altar golden altar is the adjacent to the most uh, adjacent to the veil exodus 30 verse 6 and if we surrender ourselves totally and that golden altar humble ourselves and surrender ourselves totally on that golden altar even if we do not understand all these intricacies what i am saying uh, but if we are just humble ourselves and surrender ourselves totally the lord will flood us with the holy spirit now spirit and we will be as if we are in the heavenlies and we can live a life where we are full of the joy of the lord in his presence there is fullness of joy psalm 16:11 and we can partake of the tree of life we can be fresh with the life of god all the time 24/7 and we won't be hurt by the spiritual death resultant of sin and uh, we will be having the hidden manna we will be spiritually strong all the time jesus says in john 6:35 he who comes to me will never thirst and he will uh, never be hungry uh, john 6:35 uh, i thought of closing but uh, you know the, of course i'll just conclude and we'll continue to hear from our brothers john 6:35 uh they jesus says uh jesus said to them i am the bread of life bread of life bread the word of god life the holy spirit bread of life he who comes to me will not hunger because there is bread the hidden manna and he who believes in me will never thirst because the life of the holy spirit is there in that hidden manna so uh, our thirst our spiritual thirst and spiritual hunger would be quenched it would be satiated uh, when we come to the lord the lord is there in our spirit realm you know in the most holy place that is in the heavenly most holy place is actually the heavens uh, that is what we read in hebrews 9:24 so when we come to the lord when we humble ourselves totally to, totally to the lord the lord floods us with the holy spirit because the holy spirit is the spirit of heaven it is as if when we are flooded with the holy spirit it is as if we are ascended to the heavenly they and we can experience uh, that a hidden manna that uh, where we do not hunger spiritually and uh, we have the holy spirit where the rivers of living water we are not thirsting spiritually uh and then we'll have the white stone uh and a new name the pet name that the lord calls us lovingly just like uh, mary magdalene <laughs> he didn't uh, she didn't recognize in john 20 uh who this uh, person uh, who is standing over there he she thought it would be the gardener because it was uh, early in the morning sunlight was not at fully there and also she didn't expect jesus to be there and uh, how she recognized jesus my sheep hear my voice <laughs> so john 20 there we read jesus is calling her mary you know the new name that intimacy that love is there reflected in that of course it is the same name mary only it is not a new name in that sense everybody called her mary <laughs> but when jesus called her mary with that affection with that love with that compassion uh, john 20 verse 16 jesus said to her mary she turned and said to him in hebrew rabboni which means teacher oh oh this is my jesus himself who is calling this is not some gardener 
uh, then this is saying stop clinging into me and all <laughs> so uh, there in john 10:4 we read that my sheep know my voice my sheep hear my voice john 10:27 and then john 10:4 says uh, the sheep follow him because they know his voice my sheep hear my voice uh, my sheep know my voice and that is a new name it might be i mean it it would be the same name <laughs> but it is a new name it is just like they sang a new song that you know, actually that word new can also be translated as fresh uh, they sang a a new name or a fresh name <laughs> or people would be calling uh, you know uh, calling me the same name but uh, if somebody who really loves me calls me by that same name it's a it's a fresh thing you know that revelation <coughs> 14:3 they sang a new song kainos is the greek word that can be translated as fresh recently made recent unused new <laughs> uh, it is just like fresh bread <laughs> fresh uh, you know food eh? fresh vegetables we all want fresh so there is a new song that means it would be the old it is old lines but every time we sing that we are singing as singing as if we are singing it to the lord for the first time so it's a new name uh, with that great intimacy the lord is uh, calling me with that first love uh, the lord is calling me my son my daughter and we can add their name or add our name also there and even song of songs 47 which says um uh, come to me my darling you are all together most beautiful you know i mean that was a verse that the lord had spoken to me many years ago and uh, really encourage encourage me in that brighter relationship with the lord song of songs said that i'll try to close <laughs> song of songs 47 come with uh, yeah song of songs 47 you are all together beautiful my darling we can add our name also there and there is no blemish in you i have justified you i am seeing you just as you have never ever sinned you are complete in christ colossians 2:10 you are all together beautiful my darling my sandeep or whatever your name is you can add there that's a new name there is no blemish in you come with me from lebanon my bride may you come with me verse 8 may you come with me from lebanon journey down from the summit of amana from the summit of senir and hermon from the dens of lion from the mountains of leopards come with me to the heavenly realm to the summits but there would be in that second heavens <laughs> uh, there would be the spiritual forces of darkness dens of lions and mountains of leopards and all are there but no worry i am the bridegroom is there with you so don't worry all those satanic forces might be trying to attack you and or you are with your bridegroom <laughs> come with me <laughs> uh, that is the lord is trying to tell us and you have made my heart beat faster my sister my bride how the lord is uh, so attracted to us and he loves us so dearly verse 9 how beautiful is your love my sister my bride how better is your love than wine and the fragrance of oil and then all kinds of spices verse 10 so you know if we can uh, read song of songs and read that bridegroom's part as the lord says saying to us the bride's part as we saying to the lord sincerely you know we can uh, you know uh, we can grow in that bridal passionate love relationship with the lord that simple pure devotion to the lord and have that white stone and a new name written on it which no one knows which but only uh, those who receive it maybe may, may, may each one of us have that intimacy with the lord that unique intimacy with the lord which we cannot explain in words but others would be able to sense that through our contact through our freshness through our love through our compassion through our strictness through our passion and through our zeal so may the lord help us shall we close our eyes in prayer thank you heavenly father for your richness of your word the abundance of your grace the abundance of the manna and the rivers of living water that you showered upon us in your mercy in your grace thank you jesus we bow down and adore you lord jesus lord keep us fresh in your presence all the time we do not want to stray away from your presence lord we do not want to stray away from this first love from this most holy place we want to cling on to you lord jesus thank you jesus that you call us with a new name with our pet name and lord we are the apple of your eye and uh, 
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you for your immense love. Lord, we do not want to remain a 60-fold or 30-fold harvest anymore, Lord. We want to come beyond the veil every time. And Lord, we want to overcome and be part of your bride, Lord, to sit with you on your throne. What a regret we would have if in eternity we would end up as uh, just as invitees to the wedding of the Lamb not as a bride, Lord. What a tragedy it would be, Lord. We cannot imagine that. Lord, do any work that you want to do in us and through us that can break us thoroughly, break ourselves so thoroughly that, Lord, we would be clinging on to you all the rest of the moments of our life in that deep intimacy with you, Lord Jesus. We do not want to stray away from you, Lord Jesus. We do not want to go away from you, Lord. Let your left hand be under our head and let your right hand embrace us. And Lord, make us one in spirit with you. And Lord, help us to enjoy that fullness of joy in your presence and the pleasures forevermore at your right hand, which is reserved for your bride who is at your right hand, Lord. We want to be at your right hand all the time. We want to be spiritually experienced being seated in the heavenlies even today as we set our minds on things above, not on the things of the earth. Even when we uh, see the things of the earth, we want to see it from the fresh eyes style that you are given so that we can see it from a heavenly standpoint, Lord. Let all this not be just theories to us, but be real in us through the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Clothe us with the Holy Spirit. Give us that ever new clothing of the Holy Spirit that manifests Jesus in our life, in our conduct and in our behavior, in our words and in our deeds. Help each one of us, Lord. Bless the dear brothers and sisters here. Bless them and glorify your name in Jesus' precious sweetest name we pray. Amen.